inside an island caught deep within our windswept minds caught or covered warmed up and smothered leaving all other things behind Steve Romick, welcome to Australian Musician. Oh, thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, so where did the musical journey begin for you? Well, my, my musical journey began with a desire to play guitar from the age of three, you know. I was, uh, I think probably uh, working class England, you know, where I was, and I was sure of mine's gonna play guitar. <laughs> and but, uh, you know, so I, I didn't get my first guitar until I was 15, which was a Tiesco, um, bass guitar, which I bought with a friend of mine, Wim Vink. We went into a place called Lewis Music in the city, and we, we uh, basically saw these two matching Tysco guitars, or Tiesco, I think they're called. It's funny, they're 35 bucks each. If uh, back in, what was the early 2000s, they would have been, been worth two and a half, three thousand dollars $3,000 each, because they were lawsuit Japanese copies of Fenders, you know, so. Anyway, so we uh, did this uh, $35 lay-by and the uh, guy took one look at me. I was, I was 15, I looked about nine, um, and uh, he said, right, you come back every week and put money on this, otherwise, you know, it goes back up on the wall. So I took him seriously. It's funny, I went there and I saw the guy uh, that uh, this was like a couple of years ago before Lewis Music closed down. I said, you know, I bought a Tysco bass from him with a friend of mine, Wim, you know. He said, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be able to remember that. And I said, yeah, well, I can understand that. And I said, and you told, I paid it on labor, it was 35 bucks, and you told me if I didn't come back every week and pay a certain amount and go back up on the wall. He said, no, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> you bloody did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was that was the beginning for, for me, uh, playing bass with Wim. We got together and and play. We, we started by trying to learn how to play yesterday. And I we got I got the sheet music and worked out what the notes were. We had this little guide and so I go, oh, that's an that's an F and that's an E and stuff. So I numbered did did put numbered codes on there and we spent oh, five or six, maybe seven hours in Wim's room trying to learn this song. Got four bars in and uh, at the end of it, it it was it was so brutal on my fingertips, I remember that I went home and I couldn't I couldn't touch anything. I, if I washed my hands in any temperature of water, this pain just shot up my arm. And I, I, but the next day my fingers were solid as rock. I was back round to Wim's place and we managed to get through a verse and the bridge and everything. And we thought, right, we're champions here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was, that was sort of the beginning for me. The, uh, uh, that, that, that launched me into uh, playing covers of Beatles songs. I think the next one we did was Hey Jude. We got up and performed it at a, uh, at a concert. This, cause Wim was, Wim was in a, uh, he did a, at a guitar school. He was, he performed it. He learned how to play at a guitar school with this bloody awful guitar that I tried to learn on and I couldn't. And so we, we got up there and I remember we are playing uh, Hey Jude. And I was really nervous, you know, got up, got up there and, uh, I plugged into this bass amp and everything. I was so relieved to get to the end of the song <laughs> without, with a with a minimum of uh, errors. I started walking off. This guy came up and stopped me because I was about to pull the amp head off the <laughs> off the box. And then I got down off stage and I remember, and I've told people this many times, they don't believe me. I thought that being nervous was so unpleasant that I was never going to be that way again. And my, for my whole career, I've never been nervous about getting up on stage, ever. TV, the whole thing, it's just the same to me. I figure that, for me, the way it is, if you're prepared and you know your stuff, then you've got no reason for it. I, uh, it's a bit like, um, you know, a plumber's not gonna be coming around to your house and be nervous about changing a washer on your tap. You know, I sort of think, it, think of it in those sort of terms, so I've, I've never been actually anxious or nervous about being, I get excited. Uh, so some of the shows I've been on where uh, 
I think uh, one show I was on, I was there 12 hours. I think I lost, I think I lost half a stone waiting to go. I was just, just, you know, oh wow, I'm going. You know, I was so excited to get on. And I think my metabolism just sped up about 10 times, and I was just, I couldn't sit down, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, went from there, and of course decided that I was going to write songs, uh, which was something that I decided when I was when I was younger. I think I was about 12 or 13. We were living in uh, Dallas. Uh, uh, I, I, I was going to Upfield High School, which was an awful place. Uh, it was just dreadful. It was uh, it, it awful. I was bullied uh, every day. And uh, I'd get home and of course my parents were, you know, working glass, well, go and hit them, you know. And I was like, yeah, you don't realise these guys are carrying knives and stuff, you know. If you want me to come home in a bag, yeah, fine, you know. But I was always kind of, uh, I got very, very depressed in that early part of my childhood. And f for some reason, I listened, I remember we, we, got, we got the album uh, Abbey Road. I got it for Christmas. And we had this shocking little um, uh, record player. And I put it on in the lounge room and I stood in the kitchen and imagined that the Beatles were in the next room uh, playing it. And, uh, you know, and it just made me feel good. And I thought, well, geez, if these guys can write songs, so can I, which was really interesting uh, considering the space I was in at that stage. I think I came out of uh, my early childhood with PTSD. I was just, you know, scared. Uh, except for certain things, it's really interesting. Anything related to music or performing or anything like that, I just seemed to, it just seemed to be, well, this is going to be natural for me. And I didn't, I didn't write my first decent song until I was 17. Uh, I remember I was working at Woolworths at that stage in Preston came home on the train and then I started to uh, I started to come up with these lyrics uh, while I was walking home and thinking oh, I've got to remember these I've got to remember them I've got to remember them and I I got home and I started uh, playing the guitar and coming up with this song and I, I got to the end of it and I thought I've done it I've done it haven't I <laughs> how good is that you know uh, it took me a while to learn how to perform it you know I had to learn the song but uh, yeah, it all sort of uh, started from there. I think I think music uh, was kind of my saviour when I was in my in my earlier childhood, in my my teenagehood, because it was a space I could occupy where nobody else was. And uh, also reading, uh, I was oh, I used to read six books a week. And uh, my my daughter Jessica said to me. How do you write lyrics? I said, that's easy, Jess, read. Read as much as you can get, read the classics, become familiar with the language. And um, which is, I mean, it's, it's cool. It's enabled me to uh, write in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, there's a song I wrote called The Mistress, which is old English, Emily Bronte kind of English. And, and uh, yeah, so that's sort of uh, those spaces. Uh, I think music sort of uh, enabled me to survive in those in those times. When you look back at your career, what what are the more memorable moments for you? I'll look at that a few. Um, I think uh, one of the some of the most memorable ones was um, my the first song that of mine that John Farnham did. It was a song that I wrote about uh, a woman that I'd been in love with and she broke up with me and, you know, rah, 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 blah, blah, blah. I ended up with my best friend, usual scenario. And I had a, uh, I had a verse and a core, a verse and a bridge for this song and I got together with a guy called Frank Sablotny and he said, I like it, man, let's get together and start and, and see if we can come up with a chorus. And the, uh, I'd found out that my friend had gotten together with my ex-girlfriend and she wanted to talk to me about it. So, you know, we had lunch and uh, I remember I was busking in Box Hill Mall and made enough money to buy a really nice lunch. <laughs> and um, she said to me, uh, yeah, I said, well, you know, it's fine, you know, I, I've gotten over it and all that. And she and I said, and as long as you're happy. She, and she said, oh, you know, I said, you know, I'd take you back just like that. So uh, the next day I was in 
with Frank and that line was in my head. So I wrote that song and that ended up eventually getting to Farnham and it was going to be uh, recorded for the Then Again album and everybody, you know, the anticipation was great but he did his vocal and didn't like it. And uh, that, so it ended up on the, uh, on the Anthology 3 album as a rarities. And one of the highlights that I'm talking about is I get in, and I went to uh, my ex-wife's place with my, my kids <clears throat> and we sat down and we watched the show and we watched him do it on Hey Hey It's Saturday and I uh, had the video in and of course it was on the same time as Hercules and my son wanted to watch Hercules She's, and she said, she's looking at his, he said, oh can we switch over to the other, cha to Channel 10 to watch Hercules and Mary said, no, we can't. We can't do that. We've got to watch this show. She said, oh, well, can we at least record it? She said, no, we can't do that either. <laughs> so I'm sitting there watching Farnham uh, do my song on Hey Hey It's Saturday, thinking, that's pretty cool, you know. And, uh, and then I had to go and do a gig. I was working with a corporate function band called Reflections Off, and uh, they sort of, they were giving me a hard time when I came in. I said, oh, did you... Was your name mentioned enough on the show, you know? <laughs> but uh, that, when, when that eventually led to, uh, uh, well, I, 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 had, I was sort of in a little bit, you know, and uh, Doug Brady, who was uh, uh, Farnham's engineer, uh, when I was doing the Touch album, uh, there was a song I wrote called Sometimes which was, I was in a particularly bad space in my life at that stage. You know, I couldn't get work. I was living underneath, I was living in the lower floor of my mum's boyfriend's house. And I was sitting there one day and opened it. I had this first line, which was, sometimes I feel folded like a piece of paper. Um, I folded like a piece of paper. I forgot the second line. Uh, but, you know, and I, I sort of sat there and opened D and I, and I sort of trotted off this song in a very short space of time, you know, and uh, I put it up for the Touch album and Doug heard it and uh, next he, he comes in and he said, because uh, he, was, he was producing my album, and he said, oh, I've put up, I put up a song for Farnham and I'm thinking, oh, it'll be... Uh, Tender Moments, there was another song of the Tender Moments, or uh, I Want to Touch You, Not Just Your Body, and there was a couple of songs that I thought they'd be perfect for fun. And I said, which one? And he said, Sometimes. And I thought, what? <laughs> I mean, that's completely out of, uh, out, of, um, out of that sort of realm, you know, of what fun would normally do. So as chance would have it, I ended up getting a gig in Japan. So when the album... Uh, when the last time album was released, I was in Japan doing gigs, which I think was around 2003, somewhere around there. So I organised for my family to go to uh, to go to the first concert, and uh, you know, they, my for some reason my ex-wife and my son didn't want to go. My two girls decided they wanted to go, so they were there. They're sitting in there, and the second song in Farnham. Uh, pre announcers he said, here's a song by an eccentric young songwriter. And my girls just instantly knew it was going to be my song <laughs> and jumped up and started, you know, shouting and cheering. And, uh, of course, they were only people in the audience that were doing it. Everybody was looking around, who are these idiots? And uh, Farnham said to him, oh, you must know him. He said, yeah, he's our dad. Now, that's a highlight, you know. And... It was, uh, I heard about it while I was in Japan, you know, and I was well chuffed. That uh, was, you know, that was, that's one of the highlights. Yeah. And, I, and I made money out of the, the, the thing, you know, I, I, you know, made a few thousand dollars, which helped, I was in horrible debt at that stage and helped get me out of that. And, um, you know, but that, I actually contacted Farnham and said, you know, that was, that was the thing that made it really, really special for me. And he said, yeah, I know, it's great, because my, my sons are proud of me as well, you know. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a highlight. Those sort of things are my yeah. highlights.
Um, you played slide guitar on uh, Glenn Shorrock's acoustic album. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you co-produced Jim Key's Resonator album. Yeah. Who, yeah. who taught you to play slide guitar? Well, I've been a finger picker all, all my life. So I, I, was, I, I was in a band and we were going to do a Bonnie Raitt song and there was slide on it. And they said, well, and I was the only guitar player, so what else was I going to do? So I went out and bought myself a slide, and I, and I sort of watched her play, and uh, she was using the middle finger, and I, I didn't realise it was because that was the one that was the right size for her to have a, the bottle neck on there. And uh, so I thought, well, if she's doing it like that, I will. So I went and bought myself a slide, a uh, glass slide that fit on my middle finger, and I figured it out. I just, uh, I, I automatically was able to go to block the strings that I wasn't playing. And I figured, well, it's right over the fret, otherwise it's not gonna sound right. And that's it, that was my lesson. I, uh, and I just started to play slide from there. And, uh, and I started to do, you know, I'd, I'd have a guitar in open G once I learned about open tunings and stuff, which was good which is great, I love open tunings. Um, I mean, I wrote Sometimes in Open D. Uh, there's a, a song that I did on um, Australia's Got Talent called uh, Silent Wonder, which I wrote in Open G. But uh, anyway, I just uh, started playing melodies on there. And I, one, of the, one of the things I wrote, I did a, an instrumental uh, called Sleep, and it started as an instrumental. I, I recorded it on the, um, on the Friday Sessions album. See, the reason Jim, just going over, the reason Jim decided to record at where I was, where I was living, so he rang me up and he said, Steve, do you want to play Slide on my acoustic album? And I said, well, we'll work, because Jim and I were mates. He was my mad mate. We used, to, we used to call each other up on the phone. And he's Scottish, you know. And, but he gave up his Scottish accent because he was sick of getting beaten up at school. And uh, so we would talk in a Scottish accent to each other over the phone and we just, we just joked with each other. We had a, we had a great time. And he, was, uh, he said, you know, asked me to play slide on the, on the album. And I said, well, where are you recording it? He said, well, I don't know yet. And I said, well, why don't you record it here? This was in Ivanhoe. This was just in um, Lower Heidelberg Road. It was number 288 or something. And um, it was a great room. It was a really good room. It just had this great sound in the lounge room, you know, all set up. And this old, old, you know, old piano there was 120 years old. And, and we just had, you know, so... And he said, oh, how much, how much did you charge? And uh, I said, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, hang on, I'll ask Mike, because Mike... Mike Kelly was my flatmate. I said to, said to Mike, well, how, how much should we charge? And he said, will we both be playing on it? And I said, yeah, guess. He said, oh, 650 bucks a day. So I called, called Jim up and I said, oh, 650 a day. And he said, that's seven days. And that means that's this amount. Could you do it for this amount? He, bang. <laughs> he's, 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 yeah, I think he probably could have been a mathematician if he <laughs> wasn't a singer. But... I said, yeah, righto. So we ended up uh, coming in. We spent seven days with Jim and uh, Russell and uh, Daryl came in as well. And, uh, um, and we just, uh, a bunch of acoustic instruments. Um, and I got to play his, uh, his uh, old Dobro guitar, which he had in Open G. And the first, one of the first songs we did was uh, 510 Man. And uh, yeah, I, I, I remember we, I was the, the song was in A, and the uh, and the guitar, the neck was bent on it already. So I didn't want to tune it up to A to play an open A. So I, I thought I'm going to have to work out how to do this in, and, and you know, and it was a learning experience for me. So I'm trying to figure it out, and I went to bed that night about you know 11 o'clock or whatever, and I was awake at two with this going through my mind. How am I going to do this? So I, I'm not going to get any sleep unless I bloody work this out. So I went out and grabbed the guitar and worked out how I was going to play it and also worked out the solo and all that sort of stuff. And the, the next day, he, he, you know, he arrived at the crack of midday and Mike and I were up at seven in the morning because we're both early risers and we, uh, we started recording the song, getting the beds together for it. And um, 
he said, oh, man, that's a good solo. And he said, yeah. And he's like, I worked it out in bed last night with you. He said, you mean you took my guitar to bed? <laughs> <laughs> so I did pretty much. But, uh, yeah, that was, that, was just, that was just a great experience uh, with Jim. Uh, with uh, Glenn, it was kind of interesting because uh, he wanted me to come in and play all the slide guitar parts on this thing. Uh, on his album in about an hour and a half and uh, I came in with one guitar with Jim's guitar as it turned out he let me borrow it and I looked at all the different keys and stuff that it was in I said look I need more time to work on this so uh, Glenn gave, gave me all the tracks to take home to, to do at home and uh, he put asterisks next to the ones he didn't want slide on uh, I thought they were, <laughs> you know, illogically you'd think you'd have aster asterisks next to the ones you did want uh, slide on, but uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, so I, and I, I had seven or eight hours, so I just put slide on everything, uh, including stuff that he didn't, well, the, I started with the ones with the asterisks, you know, and then went to the other ones. So I did the ones that he did want me to, because I played slide on everything, and, uh, and some of the tracks like, uh, was it, uh, I was really chuffed about, um, was it uh, that sailing song, what is it? Um, oh, what's it called? Anyway, I did, uh, did a solo on that, just a, the melody and, yeah, and they ended up using that, which I was pretty chuffed about. <clears throat> You've released many recordings, but uh, this year, yeah, you, you released an album, a self-titled album. Yeah. Uh, why didn't you give it a name? Well, um, I was going to call it I was going to call it Musical Chairs because there's a song on the album called Musical Chairs, which I wrote with uh, with Russell Morris. Well, I didn't, we weren't in the same room. I just had the the verse and the bridge, and uh, I said, and I, I knew he had uh, Logic Pro X, which is what I've got. So I sent him all the files and told him what the chords were and all that. And then I said, look, I need a chorus. He said, OK, I'll give it a fair crack. And then, then he, about a week later, he sent me back all these audio files and I just locked them in and put chords underneath and stuff. So I was going to call it Musical Chairs and I had an idea of, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and, and every, other people that were on the album were sort of standing around with these, you know, just looking at me like I was the guy that got the, the last chair, you know. I thought, that's a pretty good concept. But there's a friend of mine, Bruce Davis, who's a photographer. And uh, he, he sort of got me in. He said, look, there's this great space at an opportunity shop um, that used to be a theatre in uh, Willie Beach, uh, Williamstown. And so... I went there and he said, I've got this idea. What I want to do is I've got these wings and I'm going to do it. So we've got you up on a, up on a chair with your legs crossed and you're looking down and you've got the, the guitar there. And, uh, and then he photographed the wings and put them on separately. And he sent me the photograph and I thought, well, that's got nothing to do with musical chairs, does it? So, uh, and I thought, I've never called, the, uh, I've never done a self-titled album. I've always done it. Um, given the, the album's a name, you know, and, and, and be like, Touch, I was just, I couldn't come up with anything until the girl I was with, she said, why don't you just call it Touch? I thought, yeah, righto. Eh? <laughs> and, and did that. The Friday sessions got its names because, name because Mike Kelly and I were, we both had Fridays off. So we recorded an album on Fridays, you know. And, uh, but this one was just, uh, uh, Shifty Fingers was basically a, uh, I, I took on a persona and it didn't quite work uh, for me. And I thought, yeah, I've got to take, I've got to start taking credit for what I do. And nothing does that. Like, it's, it's when you're, you're going in, you said, well, what's your album called? It's, it's called Steve Romick. Here's my card, you know. And so people sort of, uh, who knew me, looked it up. And listen to it because you know the thing is you go away and you go, ah, oh, bug me. What's he called it? You know what is the name of it again? And uh, there's no arguments there. And I just we've got now I've got the uh, when eventually I do do CD copies, that picture will be front and center on the album, and all the writing and stuff will be on the back because it's such a great photo, you know. 
Um, you've got some great players on the album. Tell, yeah. me, tell me about the local legends that you've uh, used on this album. Well, when I was writing the album, <clears throat> I was at home, you know, in the studio. Uh, I started recording all the stuff myself and put it all together and I got a friend of mine to come over and mix it and I'd listen to it and then three days later I'd listen to it and go, uh, don't don't really like this, you know, and I, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, you know. So we're going to record a, uh, we're going to do a mix of uh, a song called uh, um, See the World. And, I, and I'd already gotten, um, you know, Nicky Nichols and May Parker and, uh, oh, they'll kill me. Uh, <laughs> Tiana Lucolano and oh yeah, she will kill me. Uh, she ended up doing um, uh, the scatty vocals on it. We'd already done that at Roger's place, so we're going to get it mixed. And I'd, I'd done the bass on it, and I called Roger McLaughlin. I said, "Man, could you do do the bass? Could you do a bass line on this?" And he said, "Well, your bass line is fine." I said, "Yeah, but I'm not Roger McLaughlin," and uh, so. He does this bass line, and I got it, got it back. And I'm, oh man, listen to that! Listen to that! It just sounded the goods. It had, you know, such tonality and and vibe and everything. So we went, and we did a, an initial mix, and then I, Roger was going, and I put programmed drums in. He said, "Man, it's great, but the drums suck. You've got to get Jerry Pantasis in to play on this." I said, yeah, okay, so I rang Jerry up and I said, would you do it? And then another person came in and said that they would do it and I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited for them to do it. And then I got the drum track in I thought, nah. So I got on to Jerry and I said, look, can you do it? And he said, yeah. So I sent him the track. Two days later it comes back and I'm thinking, and I called him, I said, Jerry, I like the song again. I just, uh, and that, that was the beginning. I thought, well, I just got to get other people in. Because it can't be all me, you know what I'm saying? I bore myself. You know, it's the ideas I came up, I find, bored me. And uh, I, I thought the songs were better than that. And um, I, goodness knows I didn't want to bore other people. And uh, so Jerry came in and I thought, well, I get uh, Ronnie Pierce. He played, uh, played the guitar solo on uh, This Side of the Moon. I remember getting it like, he sent the thing, I laid it into the track and I'm listening to it and I listened to it and listened to it and I listened to it for two hours. And I still love it. Every time that solo comes, I go, oh man, listen to that. You know, and that's that's the thing. I think um, I think it'll always work like that from now on. Uh, if I'm working on a new song at the moment and uh, I've just gotta, I just gotta come up with a, a middle eight, I'm agonizing over the middle eight and uh, once I've got that all together, I've got a friend of mine over in Nashville who I used to work with, a guy called Danny Finkelstein, who's just living in a mansion in Nashville, you know, set up a studio there. So once I've got that done, I'm going to send that off to him again to put drums on it, just to, just to try out new things, you know, and then get it to Roger. And, and yeah, I got uh, a guy called uh, Jeff Zambellis in. He played, uh, he played on, uh, like he's a, a shredder, you know, he's an amazing guitar player. You know, he's a house painter for God's sake, you know. What's he doing painting houses? He's actually, he bought out an album in 93 that went on to become, uh, be, be regarded as one of the top 1,000 rock albums of all time. And he, he didn't realise until uh, one of his mates who he was working with on a site said, uh, Sam Bellis, he said, were you in a band back in the 90s? He said, did you bring out an album? He said, yeah. And he said, you know it's selling for 693 bucks on eBay. <laughs> I went, what? <laughs> uh, so he's, he's, he's amazing. Uh, got another friend of mine, Rob Papp, who played um, on... Then uh, the song that started it all, that got me writing again, which was uh, uh, Watch the World Go By which was influenced by a, a book by John Steinbeck, 
uh, that I read years ago about two guys that all they wanted to do was sit around and get drunk all day. And I was intrigued by that. And I thought, how the hell did you get a book out of that? But he did, you know. <laughs> um, and so I, I sort of loosely based it on that. And I got uh, Rob in and he did a great solo. And Andy Cowan on keyboards for that one. I sort of went around and put the pressure on him. I said, because I just sort of went to his place and said, you know, put some piano on this. And he said, oh man, it's in the key of E. Do you know how many sharps? That's it. So he, he went in, he did this great piano part and uh, right, got, went over to Roger's place and, and got him to do it. But then I realised, well, you know, I can send people tracks. I don't have to go in and pester them and put them, put them under pressure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, so I got a, yeah, got a bunch of people in. Sarah McLean did uh, backing vocals on uh, Coming to Town. She did a great job of that. And she also did uh, backing vocals on um, Make It Go Away. It was a great, that was really serendipitous kind of a, uh, a session where we, uh, she was in there, she, she was doing a line and her voice cracked and she cackled at the end of it, you know. So uh, Rog was about to, because I was over at Roger's place, he was about to scrub and said, no, nah, well, keep that, keep that, you know, and we'll just move it somewhere and we'll, we'll, we'll do it again, you know. And uh, he, had a, he had a train whistle that his, uh, that his dad had left him. And um, he blew into it and I immediately realised it was one of the chords in the song, you know, at just the right place for it. And uh, he was telling the whole story of, of the train whistle and 20 minutes later I said, you know, that would fit right in here. <laughs> so we got it in there and uh, that, was, that was cool. I, I love that. Uh, when in each instance when you're recording with other people, something comes up that you haven't thought of. And that, that's what I love about it. And we got Becky O'Connor who came in and did backing vocals for Raft and she'd never done anything like that before and she was so good. She was amazing. She just, um, you know, I said, look, it's easy. You can sing in tune. I'll just tell you what to sing and you do it. And she did and it just worked out brilliantly, you know. So we left a bit at the end where she said, oh, thanks for letting me play and teaching me things, you know, and I just left that left that at the end of it, which was, which was cool. That's, uh, yeah. John Grant, did I see his face in a video? Yeah, yeah, he didn't play on anything, but, um, you know, he, I asked him if he'd, uh, if he'd come in and, uh, cause I, I'm, I want to use him when we play live, cause uh, Andy Cowan recommended him as a, a keyboard player. So I thought, well, let's uh, get the guys in and, and do it. And John was great, he set the whole mood for the for the the video for this side of the moon he said oh, oh let me let me do my take first and he did this you know this real he had this real flair with oh, great so the 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 video went from there we just sort of that was the vibe for the whole thing is fantastic i'm looking forward to playing with them on stage with these songs too it's gonna be yeah. great so what's the plan in regard to playing the songs live well i've all I've, I've been a bit reticent to do anything, you know, I've, in the back of my mind I sort of thought of doing a launch and everything, but I'm, I don't have much confidence in my ability to attract an audience is the thing. So uh, oh, I should probably have more confidence in myself because it surprises me how many people know me. You know, walking through a supermarket, one of these guys says, hi Steve, I didn't know the guy from Adam. I said, oh, good day, how are you? <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> but uh, so I'm, I'm going to look at... Um, early next year maybe going to, I've had a few suggestions about smaller places I can start out, uh, like um, uh, George's Lane in St Kilda, and John from the Wamba, he said, I'll oh, come in and do it at my venue, you know, so I thought, well great, I'll, early next year I'll organise to get, uh, get some of those done and, and see how it goes, you uh, know, it's sort of, uh, it's always, uh, you're always a bit worried about, well, if nobody shows up, I've got to play the, pay the band, I've got to pay for the venue, I've got to pay for the sound engineer, I've got to pay for the lighting and all that. And um, I'm not, uh, not exactly made of money, you know. <laughs> I'll owe you, OK? <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think once people... Uh, I've, been, I've, been doing a, I've been doing an open mic night down on the peninsula at the, at the sound bar. 
And they're uh, kind of, uh, while they were doing this, I, I got up and I played um, Coming to Town live and, on, on acoustic and um, This Side of the Moon. And there's also another song which I do in there, which is sort of my party piece called Leftover Martyrs. It's a, it's, it's a ballad that I wrote and I can't remember writing it. It's really funny. I can't remember. I'm the, oh, when did you write that? I've got no freaking idea. I think I've got an idea where it was, but when it was, I, I, I got, it just maybe just, it, whenever I sing it, it's like it's always been there. And it's, it's an impressive tune. I was still looking and go, did I do that? <laughs> but um, so, you know, I, I, I went in and did the open mic there. Two weeks later, I came in and I repeated those songs and people were singing along with them. I thought, well, I, I think I might have something here, you know. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I've been doing, sort of getting in and doing open mics. I'm going to be staying in St Kilda uh, at Roger's place from the 21st. So I want to go and see if I can get into George's Lane and talk to whoever is there and, and figure out how I'm going to do this. Apparently, it's a really good venue. Nikki Nichols recommended it, said it's got a great sound system, really good vibe, great decor, great people, you know, which is what I want. I want it to be as easy as possible because I did a launch for Touch and the guy that whose venue <laughs> that we played at was classic. <laughs> he was just a very angry person all the time. <laughs> I remember we, we got we got three or four hundred people in there. He had two people on staff. I think he probably would have done 20 or 30 grand over the bar with food and all that sort of stuff. And he said, you know, we had all this gear and said, right, I want you out of here by one o'clock in the morning. And I, you reckon? Because <laughs> I'd hauled all the gear up there with the guys and I was, I was pressing the flesh as you do afterwards. And he said, uh, no, I want it down. So I said, look, sorry guys. And I had to go in and get my work clothes on and, and haul the PA down the, down the stairs. But this is great. This, they've already got the system and everything. I don't want to repeat of that. That was a good night, that night. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, talk about some of the guitars that you used on the album or used in general. Um, what's this one you're holding at the moment? This one's, this one's Billy. This was a, a, a Strat that um, I had built by a guy um, at, uh, we called him the Grim Repairer at uh, <laughs> Billy's side. His name was Cam Grinrod and still is by, the, by, by all reports. Um, I had, it was a funny situation, this guy came into the shop one day and he said, uh, and I'd, I'd been trying out a Strat that had 57 pickups on it, and I said, oh man, I'll try this, this Strat, it's got 57 pickups on it, I love it. He said, I bought some 57 pickups, I don't like them, do you want them? And I said, yeah, righto. So I, <laughs> he came in one day, just gave them to me, and of course there I was with these pickups thinking, what the hell am I going to do with these? And uh, there was a few suggestions rolled around and everything, and I got a body and I didn't like the look of it. And one day I went in, there was a, uh, a Japanese body at a, uh, a shop in, what do they call it, in, in Oakley. And, um, and then one day the same guy came in, he said, look, I bought this John Mayer neck, I don't like it, do you want it? I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> and anyway, so I knew when, when, when the guitar was being put together, I knew that um, I was going to be leaving Billy Hyde's because of, you know, it became Alan's Billy Hyde's and not to put too fine a word on it, but the, the managers were assholes. You know, the people who bought the business would just had no idea. And I knew my time there was, was limited. So I thought I've got to get everybody in the shop to, to sign this. And of course, some people signed it here. So I had to get a clear a plastic scratch plate to put on it. I've got, got Ron, the final signature on that was Ronnie Beaumont who left us a couple of weeks ago um, and years later I got some, I changed the pickups for Kinman pickups. I put a, uh, a Vega trim on it which is because the other one they had on there the was wearing out and bits were falling off it that were irreplaceable so I thought and this guy had come into the shop and he said uh, we got the, this, these Spanish tremolo arms, and I'd always fancied having a tremolo arm that actually worked. Where the uh, the last one I had, the the um, the arm would stay in there, and you couldn't get it out, or it'd fall out on its own. <laughs> I was getting browned off with it. But this one's really cool. So I used this. Um, 
I had a couple of Variaxes that got stolen uh, earlier last year while I was away in England. And I, a lot of the, there was a lot of sounds from that, uh, you know, things like Rickenbacker 12 strings and sitars and uh, a bunch of other, you know, classic guitars that you know, I, I didn't own. So uh, that, was, that was really handy, but I used this for a, for a bunch of stuff. Um, and my, my mate and acoustic. I should have probably bought that instead of, I've got a Cole Clark there, which I'm going to be using for live gigs, but uh, my mate and acoustic, uh, which I bought from a friend of mine back in the early, in late 80s actually. Was it late? No, it was early 90s, because I wrote a song, my first song I wrote on it was a song called We Don't Get Too Close In Case You Cry. And, um, yeah, that was my gigging guitar for ages, and it's the love of my life, you know. It's, it's, I look at it and go, oh, man. But it just great, great acoustic sound, great for rhythm parts, great for finger picking. Um, I did some experimenting with uh, things like uh, 12 string guitars, where I would, um, uh, for, for the musicians who are watching this, I would take the, uh, uh, you know, how um, the first four strings, the, the strings are an octave above each other. Well, what I did was I tuned the high strings down to a fifth above the low strings. So basically, if you're playing a G chord, you've got a D chord over the top of it called chord stacking. And I used that for, for songs like uh, This Side of the Moon, that, uh, that bit, and that was all, like, this huge sound, and you hear the chord, but you don't realise just how many notes are involved because of, uh, you know, the, the different tuning of the guitar. Um, yeah, that, I had a, I had a, a uh, what was it, uh, I forgot that I had, but it's a 12 string I had, I had to sell, because my, uh, yeah, my, I needed to get my car fixed. <laughs> that old musician standby, you know, just get out and walk. Keep your guitars and just walk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's basically this is just one of the guitars I used. Do you want to <coughs> grab the clock? clock the yeah. <clears throat> Look at that. It's a hybrid. Yeah, it's a hybrid, yeah. Yeah, this is, I'm digging this guitar. I sort of uh, thought, well, I want to get a situation where I can have acoustic and electrics coming out at the same time when I'm playing, playing live and be able to just not have to swap guitars. I probably will anyway. Yeah, so this but, is um, the new true hybrid Yeah, guitar. yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it sounds great acoustically. They, uh, I was talking to Miles, as Miles was my boss at Billy Hyde's, Miles Jackson, and he was telling me, telling me about it uh, early last year. And, you know, I went, ooh, ooh, that sounds interesting, because he talked about how Paul, you know Paul Gale? Yeah, how he's done this thing where he's, uh, he's made it so all the, he's you can adjust the volume on all the poles, so it's even when you've got a, an acoustic when you've got acoustic strings, which generally, you know, with most of these things, you have to change them out for nickel strings. But uh, I've yet to get, get it in full flight. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. Don't use this a couple of times at, uh, at open mics and stuff, where I just use the acoustic. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to experimenting with it while I'm recording and see what I can come, come up with there. Because I, I remember reading about the Rolling Stones, they would do a, uh, uh, the reason the guitar sounds were so fat was that uh, Keith would double them with an acoustic underneath and gave them a real beefy sound. You didn't notice it. That's what a lot of thing I like about recording. People do stuff that you don't notice, but you'd notice if it wasn't there, you know. So, uh, yeah, this is a great guitar, all Blackwood. It's a killer. Uh, apart from the new album and, and playing it live, um, any bucket list projects in the back of your mind uh, you've always wanted to do? Bucket list projects? Uh, I have been toying... I, I sort of... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think too far ahead, actually. I'm just happy for when the next song arrives, you know. 
um, the next idea arrives. I, I sort of the the last uh, the last album there was there was such a rich vein of information um, available uh, during COVID with everything that was going on that um, it was just I, I couldn't stop myself you know writing now I'm I'm in blank page syndrome where you just you know uh, that no matter how how good the the thing I'm my next bucket list is my next song you know getting the next song done. And getting it recorded and, and stuff uh, that will be and then the next one after that you know where you it's it is one of those things with somebody who writes songs and I've been talking to a few people about this where they're people saying that uh, artists are egotists and all that sort of stuff and I say you reckon I mean, you, you do something really good and everybody loves it and then you as soon as you leave that situation you've got a blank page waiting for you and there's no room for ego there you're just you're grateful to be able to get some kind of idea of uh, what you're going to put on that page you know that's but I, I, I think as far as uh, bucket list because I'm, I'm an English person, I want to go back to England and stay with my aunt and uncle if I possibly can again in Cornwall and use that as a base of operations to try and get over to Europe, uh, Germany and places like that and start performing the album over there. I guess the bucket list really is to get in and get in with Roger and, and Jerry hopefully, he's always busy, and, uh, and maybe Sarah McLean and John Grant and Jeff Zambellis and get out and and play gigs and try these out, these uh, songs out in front of a live audience with a band. Because I got, I, I think they'll love them. I, I, uh, I, I love it. I'm not blowing my own horn, but I'm so critical of everything I, everything I've done um, up to this point. And to have an album that I'm really, really happy with is just brilliant. Yeah. Steve Robbing, uh, thanks for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Had a ball. Thank you for having me.